Today I want to share with you my beginner's guide to kombucha making. I'm going to walk you through step by step from beginning to end, plus we'll do a second ferment with fruit and we'll diagnose common problems you may run into and I'll share with you how to fix them. sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like sourdough, bone broth, ferments, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. So what exactly is kombucha? All it is is a fermented tea, and it's usually a fermented black tea, and it's fermented with something called a SCOBY. And SCOBY stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. It's that simple. Now this SCOBY, this Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast, has adapted over the years that it's been around to survive on the caffeine, among other things, that's in black tea. And that's why making kombucha with black tea often works the best. And that's what I recommend that you start with if you're a beginner. Yes, if you get a strong enough SCOBY over time, uh, you can adapt it to making it with green tea. Uh, some people have even had success using herb tea. But for a beginner, I highly recommend that you start with black tea. And this is just organic black tea. Now what you're gonna to need to make kombucha is a gallon sized jar, any gallon sized jar, this is a glass jar. You're gonna want eight, as I said, black tea bags. You're gonna need your SCOBY. And you're also gonna want a cup of sugar. And you're also gonna want two cups of previously made kombucha. Now don't worry about this previously made kombucha because you may be saying, I'm a beginner, this is my first batch that I'm making. I don't have any previously made kombucha. It's not a problem. Now when you get your SCOBY, if maybe if someone gave it to you or if you bought it, you may be able to get some kombucha, just the plain, regular kombucha with it. Sometimes a friend who maybe gave you the SCOBY can give you some, or when you buy a SCOBY online, sometimes they also send you enough uh, kombucha to use to make your first batch. But if all you have is the SCOBY, don't worry. The reason that we're using this uh, previously made kombucha is to help give the new batch the correct level of acidity. But in a pinch, if you don't have that and this is your first time that you're making kombucha, you can use two tablespoons of vinegar, but you want to use a distilled white vinegar. And the reason is, if you try to use an apple cider vinegar or a raw apple cider vinegar especially, that can have vinegar eels in it. Now, they're not really eels, they're little nematodes, and they're of no harm to humans. However, they may eat your SCOBY, so, if you add vinegar to it, because you need to get this to the right level of acidity that the SCOBY will be happy in, use a white distilled vinegar. Now, a lot of purists really don't like you to use vinegar. You know, kombucha purist <laughs> makers uh, don't uh, like the idea of adding vinegar. Um, but if you have absolutely no ability to get a previous made batch of just plain kombucha, then I really think it's okay to use, especially to get your kombucha going. And the final thing that you're gonna need is just a little bit of clean fabric and a rubber band or some kitchen twine. And that's what we're gonna use to cover our, our jar here with. Alrighty, well, we're gonna get started and we're gonna fill this with three quarts of water that we heat up. Well, I've got my water heated up and I like to bring it up to a boil, just like if you were making tea just as if you were making a proper cup of tea. Now it does have to cool down to a certain temperature after we brew the tea, uh, before we can proceed. But I really do like to bring the, the water up to a boil. I know some people don't, but I think that if you were brewing, as I said, a proper cup of tea, you would bring the water up to a boil, let it cool a little bit, put in your tea bag and proceed. 
and that's supposed to make the best cup of tea. So I feel that we should in order to guarantee that we get the best tasting kombucha, we should start with a process that makes the best cup of tea. So I'm going to pour my first two quarts of water into this measuring cup. Put this back down. That's heavy. <laughs> and we'll pour this into our jar. And you want to make sure it's a clean jar. That's a very important thing. Uh, not only working with kombucha or any ferment, you want to make sure you keep everything very clean because you don't want to introduce bad bacteria and give it the potential to proliferate over the good bacteria and the good yeast. And now we'll get that final quart of water. All right, and here goes our final quart to bring this up to a total of three quarts of hot water. And the reason not only, it's interesting because we're heating this water so that the sugar will dissolve in it. But as I said, we're also making tea, so we need to have some nice hot water. Now what I like to do is take a piece of string and tie my tea bags together. And for this size gallon jar, we're going to use eight tea bags. As I said, this is black caffeinated tea. The reason I like to tie these together, it just makes it easier to get them in and out. Now we could go ahead and just put the tea bags in right like that, but just in case they were to slide in, I wouldn't want the little uh, pieces here of paper to go also down into the water. So what I find easier to do is, as I said, I tied these all together to keep them together, and then I just like to pull off these little pieces of paper that are on top of the tea bag strings. Alrighty, and we'll just go and submerge our tea bags into here and let them steep. Now we're going to let them steep for about 10 minutes. And that's really all you want to do. Uh, technically, if you were just making a cup of black tea, you might just steep your cup of tea for three to five minutes. But the SCOBY really likes the caffeine, so we will steep this for about 10 minutes, but you don't want to steep it for much longer than that because what can happen is the tea can get too strong and then it can have an off flavor when you go to finally make your kombucha. Well, we'll let that steep for 10 minutes and then we'll remove the tea bags and I'll show you how to remove them. Well, we let these tea bags steep for 10 minutes. Now we'll go ahead and we'll remove them and I'll show you what you want to do. As you remove these, do not squeeze them or press the tea bags against the side of the jar. Just get a plate to catch all of the drippings. You can let a little bit drip out like that. And then just remove them one, two, three. You don't want to squeeze these because you don't want to release too much of the tannic acid that can give your kombucha, your end product kombucha, a very strong uh, flavor. So just steep it for 10 minutes and then gently remove your tea bags. Now you want to go ahead and add your cup of sugar. This is one cup of white sugar. This is an organic white sugar, but it is white sugar. That works the best. As a beginner, I completely recommend that you do it this way. And the uh, yeast and bacteria are going to eat up a lot of the sugar. Yes, this is a sweetened beverage. It still will have it have a very tangy taste to it if you've ever tasted store-bought kombucha, almost vinegary and effervescent, um, but with just a touch of sweetness because the SCOBY, uh, the yeast and bacteria in the SCOBY will feed on some of this sugar, but not all of it. Uh, so I know that is a concern for people who are trying to avoid uh, sweetened beverages. And in that case, I recommend that for good probiotics, you rely more on your fermented vegetables as opposed to these fermented drinks that do require adding sugar. Then we'll just help the sugar along to dissolve in this hot water, but it should dissolve pretty quickly. And then we're just going to let this cool. We want this to cool down to somewhere between 68 and about 85 degrees. We don't uh, want it as hot as it is now because that'll hurt the SCOBY, but this heat will help the sugar dissolve 
and then uh, we'll allow it to cool down. Now I usually just let mine cool down naturally and then I go about doing other things in my home. Uh, but if you are in a bit of a rush, you can always put this, uh, you can pick up this jar and put it in a bit. It's a little hot so you may want to use pot holders and place it into a little water ice bath. If you have a little bucket, little dish bucket, uh, like, oh, I have one in my sink there. Uh, and put a little ice water, some ice and some water, make a little ice water bath. And then you can lift this up and put it down into there to help it cool off quicker. But as I said, I usually just let it cool naturally. Well, I've let this cool down and I used a clean thermometer, food thermometer, to check it and it's under 80 degrees, um, maybe around 77, 78 degrees, right around there. So it's perfect and we can get ready to proceed with the next step. But before we do that, I just wanted to explain to you what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, if you need to cool this down quickly, what you can do is take your jar of the tea, put it into a bin like this. This is what I was talking about. This is my, my little wash bin in the sink. But you can put it in a bin like this, fill it with cold water, and you know, just up to about the height of the, the tea that's in the jar, and let it sit in there in the cool water. You can add some ice cubes, and let it cool that way, and it'll cool a little quicker. Now don't worry if you don't have a food thermometer. You can definitely check this by telling that it's room temperature. That's what you're looking for, 68 to 85 degrees. It's a nice broad range. Uh, uh, liquid of that temperature feels cool to the touch. Not even really, this is, as I said, is somewhere between 77, 78 degrees. You can take a clean straw like this. You can take a little out, just put it on your wrist like how they used to check the baby's formula in the old days, and it just feels comfortable. So then you'll know just a nice comfortable temperature. You could easily put your hand in there and that's a proper room temperature. Now we're going to go ahead and add in our uh, kombucha from a previous batch. And we're just going to go ahead and pour that in. And now if you don't have this, don't worry. You'll just go ahead. I'm just going to swizzle that around a little to get every little last bit. Uh, don't worry if you don't have this. As I said, you can just go ahead and add the two tablespoons of uh, white vinegar, distilled white vinegar uh, that has been pasteurized so that you have no worry about the vinegar eels that can damage your SCOBY. And you can add a little extra filtered water. Well, I'm going to go wash my hands before I even touch the SCOBY. I've got it sitting here on the plate in some kombucha. And I'll get ready to pick that up and we're going to put this into the jar with very clean hands. It's very important. Okay, my hands are nice and clean and dry, and we'll get ready to put this SCOBY into this jar. But before I do, I just want to mention that if you don't have a SCOBY, if you've not been able to get one from a friend and you have to purchase one, I'll put a link below to where you can uh, order these. Um, there's many places you can order them from. Uh, you can even get them on Amazon. And But if you live in an area where there may be a small little sort of boutique brewery that makes kombucha, uh, they may actually sell them. So that's something to look into as well. Now when you go to pick it up, you're going to find that it's very flexible and it you know feels somewhat jelly-like. And it may be like this where it ha it's got a little bit of a, a layer in it and that's fine. This is a very nice, healthy, thick SCOBY. And we'll go ahead and we'll put that right down into our jar. Perfect. Now, don't worry if it floats, don't worry if it sinks. Either way is fine. Now, we're going to let this ferment for at least seven days. And at seven days, we'll take a taste and we'll see how we like it. Some people like the way it tastes at seven days. Some people prefer it maybe at 10 days or 14 days. I like it nice and tangy. So if you like it nice and tangy, you're probably going to be more inclined to go 10 or 14 days. If you like it a little sweeter, then seven days is probably going to be good. But when you get ready to test it, what you want to do is you get another clean straw. We use that one to test the temperature. And the SCOBYs don't like metal. Now, it's not the end of the world if you put a little teaspoon in there, but uh, generally they just don't like metal. So the best way to take a little taste is to just put your straw in, take out a little bit, 
and then give it a taste. And if you like the way it is, then we'll be ready to move on to the next step. But for now, we're just going to let this sit for seven days. We'll take a taste at that point. And if we like it, great. If not, we'll go 10 or 14 days. So what we want to do at this point is take our cloth that we talked about earlier, nice clean cloth, and cloth works well for this. The coffee filters may not fit fully uh, that you've seen me use in some of other ferments like making vinegar. And also too, if you have any problem at all in your house uh, with fruit flies and that type of thing, uh, having a nice thick cloth really helps prevent them being able to get into the kombucha. So now what we want to do is just keep this in a uh, warm, you know, room temperature warm, as I said, 68 to 85 degrees uh, area in your home out of direct sunlight. So you can put this in a cupboard and then just go ahead and check on it in seven days. Well, it's been 14 days now, and I checked this at seven days, but it was still a little too sweet for me. And now I checked it at 14 days, took a little taste, and it's perfect, just the way I like it. Now, if you taste your kombucha at 14 days and you still feel it's a little sweeter than you'd like, you can let it go a little longer. Some people let it go up to about 20 days. Now, what I want to show you is this is the original SCOBY that we started with, and I'll overlay a picture. And when you go to put this in, as we did uh, in the beginning when we were originally making our kombucha, is it may float at the top a little, it may sink down to the bottom, it may float up to the top again. All of that's completely normal. What you're going to notice though, over those seven to 14 or maybe even 20 days, if you let it go a little longer, if you like it more tangy, is that you're going to start to grow another SCOBY right here on top. Now I'm gonna give my hands a good wash and dry before I go in there. And we're gonna take out these SCOBYs and then I'll show you what you're gonna do next. Now what you wanna do is get some sort of bowl uh, or even another jar like this will be fine. And you'll just want to get both of those scobies out of there. Sometimes they'll be connected. Sometimes they will have separated. It really depends. Now, this was our original one. And this is our new one that's on top. Now, with the original one, this is one that you can give away to a friend if you have somebody who would like to make some kombucha. If so, you can give this to them and give them some of the starter tea and they'll be all set to make another batch. Now there are a lot of different things that you can do with this scoby. I've heard some people will chop it up and throw it into their garden as fertilizer. Uh, other people like to put it into their compost pile. And I've even heard that some people will cut this up and dehydrate it and make like a scoby jerky. Now I've not tried that, but that's very intriguing. Now, if you do want to give this to someone and you don't have the ability to give it to them right away, don't refrigerate it. A lot of people make that mistake. A scoby doesn't like to be cold. And if you make it cold, it can actually develop mold. And it can be very difficult to then get it to make a good quality kombucha. And even if it doesn't develop mold, because the cold weakens it, it can make a weaker kombucha. Instead, what you want to do is create a SCOBY hotel where you keep your SCOBYs uh, at room temperature. And a SCOBY hotel can really be any type of container, even a jar like this, where you just put your SCOBYs in, put a little bit of the kombucha tea with them, and then just keep them at room temperature. Now this one in the bowl here is our baby uh, SCOBY. And this is our new SCOBY. And sometimes it'll be a little lighter on top uh, where it was the most exposed to the air. And then underneath you'll see it looks very similar to the mama SCOBY. And you may even find that it has layers like this. And that's completely normal. Now when you go to ferment another batch of tea and turn it into kombucha, you can go ahead and use this new SCOBY. Now your kombucha at this point is all ready to drink. However, if you want to make it fizzy, then you'll need to do a second ferment. Now before you do anything, you want to give this a good stir so that you get all of the good bacteria nicely spread throughout the entire amount of liquid here. There's even some effervescence to it already. And then the next thing you want to do is pour off two cups. And this is very important. Now, with this two cups, 
you want to keep this aside for making your next batch of tea or your next batch of fermented tea, kombucha. So you just want to go ahead and pour that over your scobies and now you're all set. Those can go into your SCOBY motel, hotel until you're ready uh, to make your next batch of, of kombucha. And just to clarify, this is a two cup measuring cup. So it's two measured cups of the kombucha tea that you want to reserve and set aside for making your next batch of kombucha tea. Now when it comes to making the second ferment, you have a couple of options. You can use different types of bottles. I like to just put it in a bottle like this that has a screw top and some people like to put them, this is a small version, but some people like to put them in these bottles that have the swing top. And the reason is these will really hold the carbonation. But as I've shared with you in the past, I really don't like uh, putting anything that's fermented and becomes effervescent in these swing top bottles. They can break. Uh, so if you do decide that you want to do the second ferment in something like this, I would recommend that you do burp this every day or every other day uh, if you decide to keep this in your fridge for a while, just to make sure that it doesn't become overly carbonated. And as a second measure of prevention, I would recommend putting these into some sort of plastic container that has a lid. So the, in, in the event that they break, and they do break sometimes, at least you have it all contained in your plastic container. And another point I want to make about swing top bottles, if you do decide to do the second ferment in this type of bottle, make sure that you're using a bottle that is made for effervescent beverages. You'll often see them sold by um, home brewery type companies where people are making beer at home and so on and so forth so that you have a bottle that's specifically made to withstand the carbonation. But my attitude about kombucha is that this is made with sugar and although the SCOBY eats up a lot of the sugar, there is still some sugar remaining. So it is a sweetened fermented beverage. And if you are watching your sugar, as I mentioned earlier, you'll really want to use fermented vegetables as your main source for probiotics. And I have a whole playlist where I make all different types of fermented vegetables. And I'll link to that in the iCards and in the description below. But the reason I don't do a second ferment in a bottle like this is it's not necessary for me to maintain the carbonation for a long time. I feel that kombucha, uh, just like many of the fermented uh, beverages that use sugar, like the fermented sodas and that I've made with the ginger bug and so on and so forth in the past, really are a, more of a treat. And so I'm fine making them in these screw top bottles. They'll hold the carbonation for a day or two and we'll drink it within a day or two and then I don't have to worry about it. Now when you proceed with a second ferment, that's when you add your flavorings. You can make a ginger kombucha, you can make a lemon kombucha, you can make any kind of fruit kombucha. I've got strawberries here. Berries are great for making flavored kombuchas. Really any mix you want and that's what's so nice about making homemade kombucha because you can make the flavor you want. You could even mix all three of these. You could have a ginger lemon berry kombucha. You can really use any fruit that's in season and the natural sugars that are in fruit will help to feed the kombucha and will cause the fizziness. They'll be feeding the, back, the good bacteria and that releases CO2 and that's what causes the fizz. Now, that said, if you decide you just wanna do a ginger kombucha or you just wanna do a lemon kombucha, and this is a Meyer lemon. If you can find these when they're in season, they're very nice. They're a little sweeter than a traditional lemon. But either way, if you do something like this, that doesn't, especially the ginger, that doesn't have a lot of you know, natural sugars in it, in order to get a really nice fizz, you may at this point want to add in a little sweetener that'll help feed the good bacteria. You could add a little raw sugar, uh, you could add, just add plain white organic cane sugar, or you could use the raw sugar, the um, dried, you know, you often you see it as rapadura or sucanat, things like that. It's just the dried cane juice. Whatever type of uh, real natural sweetener that you want that would feed the good bacteria. 
And that will help in the case of like a lemon or ginger that doesn't have a lot of the natural fruit sugars like your berries or other fruits you'd use in season. Melon is very nice. Pear can be very nice. There's a lot of different things that you can do in terms of flavoring them. Now, let's talk about how we're going to flavor this. If you want to make a lemon kombucha, you'll just want to put some of the lemon juice from the lemon into your bottle. And really, it's, it's, at this point, it's trial and error. You're going to want to experiment uh, with how much you like. But maybe a half of the, the juice of this lemon, maybe make two bottles of lemon and put the juice of half a lemon in each bottle with a little bit of a natural sweetener. Uh, the same with ginger, again, about a one inch knob uh, chopped up and put into your bottle, a little natural sweetener, that'll be lovely. Now if you go ahead and use a lemon juice, that's perfect because you're really not going to need to strain anything uh, before serving it. If you have the little pieces of ginger in it, um, you may want, you don't have to, you know, it's basically going to float to the bottom. You don't have to strain it, uh, but you may want to. Another option is to puree the ginger or grate it really, really fine where it's basically a puree and then it'll just be kind of floating down on the bottom and you don't need to worry about it. If it is in little pieces because of the natural fizz that's going to be created in the second ferment, it may float to the top. So then when you go to drink it, you'd have those little pieces of ginger in your mouth, so you may want to strain it. And the same goes for any type of fruit that you want to use. You just want to cut it up, put it into your jar, just a little bit down here on the bottom, and then you're going to pour in your fermented tea, and then you're going to let it ferment. But again, when you go to drink it, if you've just put in pieces of fruit, uh, when the fruit may come out of the jar or out of the bottle, uh, so you may want to strain it. However, just as I mentioned with grating the ginger very fine to the point where it's a puree, I really prefer to puree the fruit. And especially if there's any seeds and whatnot, get all of that out and just have a nice little bit of puree and put some of that down at the bottom of the jar or the bottom of the, of the bottle. And that way, it's going to make a lovely second ferment and when you go to drink it, there's just some puree. You know, you don't shake kombucha too much because it can be a little, uh, a little effervescent uh, before you open it. But after you open it and you swirl it around a little, that puree is just going to mix in uh, with the rest of your, uh, your fermented tea, your kombucha, and it's very pleasant. So the choice is really up to you. But today what I thought we'd do is make a nice strawberry kombucha. Now what I've done is just wash and slice up about a cup or so of strawberries. That's all you need for a bottle that's about 16 ounces. And I've removed the stems, washed them up, sliced them, and now I'm just going to send them for a whirl to puree them. That just took about 30 seconds, and now at this point, if you don't mind the little strawberry seeds, you can go ahead and pour this right into your jar. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a second step and I'm going to send this through a little fine mesh strainer just to get out those seeds and have the strawberry uh, puree nice and smooth. Alrighty, now I've got this all beautifully pureed and I've removed those little strawberry seeds and I'm just gonna use a funnel here to get this into my bottle. Now because this was basically a cup of strawberries uh, before we pureed it, there is probably enough fruit sugar in here uh, to give this a nice flavor uh, and to give enough food to the kombucha, to the good bacteria in the kombucha, to create some effervescence. But if you want to uh, sweeten this up a bit at this point, you certainly can. You can add a little honey, uh, you can add a little maple syrup, you can add, as we said, uh, with the ginger and the lemon, you can add a little organic white cane sugar or a little bit of the dried cane juice, whatever you want. Now, before we get ready to put this into the measuring cup to pour, just to make it easy to pour into the bottle, we want to give this another good stir because this is a problem that a lot of people can run into. They say, oh, my kombucha didn't come out very good. It didn't become very effervescent. It didn't taste very good, whatever the case may be. And that can be because they didn't give the mother here, the main uh, kombucha tea, a good stir to distribute that good bacteria really well throughout the entire liquid. So make sure you give that a good stir. 
Alrighty, yeah, see this is even a little naturally effervescent itself. And I'm just gonna go ahead and pour about two cups. As I said, this is my two cup measuring cup. And then we'll just go ahead now and pour this right into our bottle. Now, as we get closer to the top, we wanna make sure that we leave at least an inch or so, <laughs> measure with my thumb, about an inch of headspace to allow uh, for the carbonation. Then I've got another clean spoon here uh, with the clean handle, and I'm just gonna give this a stir to help incorporate all of that strawberry puree. You can also use, you've seen me, I often when I make the uh, homemade vinegar, I use a, a wooden chopstick, which works really well. And one of, one of you shared with me that, Mary, you can also just use the handle of the wooden spoon. And I thought, that's great, of course. <laughs> so as you'll see, the tea itself uh, was quite effervescent all on its own. But now adding this puree and that fruit sugar that's in there is really going to help it become effervescent. Now what you want to do is just put the cap on, tighten it, and you want to put this again in a room temperature place anywhere, you know, in your kitchen, in your pantry, whatever the case may be, out of direct sunlight. And you're going to want to leave it for about three to five days. It may even become to the level of effervescence you like after two days if you're doing this in very warm weather and your kitchen is very warm. But generally about three to five days will get it being nice and effervescent. And I do recommend after the second day coming by and giving it a little burp so that uh, it doesn't build up too much CO2, too much of that carbon dioxide and create any problems for you. Um, so after the second day, just come and burp it. And after three to five days, when it looks nice and effervescent and you're happy with the appearance of it, you can refrigerate it at that point and once it's cool, enjoy it, or you can enjoy it at room temperature, or you can pour it over ice and enjoy it, whatever way you like. Now a little tip I wanna share with you, I highly recommend you put your jar, and I always tell you this when we make any kind of ferment, you may wanna put it in a jar because this is not, you know, a 100% tight seal. And as the, uh, now granted we did leave the one inch of headspace, but as it ferments, sometimes a little bit can actually come out uh, through the lid and down the sides. And this way, by having this in a bowl, you can keep your counter neat and clean, or if you have it in your pantry, keep everything neat and clean. And the other reason that's nice to have it in a bowl like this is when you do go to burp it, sometimes you can get a little bit of overflow. And again, this will just keep everything neat and clean. Now, after the three to five days, when you get to the level of carbonation that you like, and you go ahead and put this in your refrigerator uh, to cool it down, if you're gonna drink it that same day, it'll probably be very effervescent. Given that this is not a swing top bottle, so it's not super tight, that after a couple of days, this is gonna start to lose some of its carbonation. So if you are interested in keeping it highly carbonated, then you would want to use uh, the swing top bottle instead of the screw top bottles, because after a few days, this will start to lose its carbonation. But as I said, this is more of a treat. I say cool it down, enjoy it pretty quickly, and you don't have to worry about dealing with the swing top bottles. And now with the rest of this kombucha tea, you can go ahead and do a second ferment like we did here. You can do more strawberry, different flavors, or you can just drink this straight the way it is, whatever the case may be. It's totally up to you. Now I wanna talk about diagnosing some problems that you may experience as a new kombucha maker. If your SCOBY has little tendrils coming down off of it, as you see it during the 7, 14, 20 day process, and I'll overlay a picture so you can see what I'm talking about. Don't worry, that's very normal. So if you see that happening, that's not a problem. And the next thing I wanna mention is that if someone has given you a SCOBY or you've purchased a SCOBY, uh, then keep it at room temperature in the kombucha tea that was given to you that came with the one you purchased or that a friend gave to you. Do not put this in the refrigerator as I mentioned earlier because that will make it more difficult for you to make uh, kombucha with it. Now when you get your SCOBY, whether you purchase it or whether someone gave it to you and you're ready to make your first batch of, of kombucha or you're ready now to make your second batch of kombucha now that you made your first here with me, 
don't rinse the SCOBY. Never rinse your SCOBY with water or anything like that. You want to just have it sitting in its tea and be ready for, for uh, it to make your kombucha. And whether you're making a batch of kombucha or you're maintaining your SCOBY in a SCOBY hotel, don't let it be in direct sunlight. Keep it at room temperature, but keep it out of direct sunlight. And the reason you don't want to have it in direct sunlight, like with any ferment, the rise and fall in different temperatures can create a very unhospitable environment for the yeast and bacteria. So that's why you always want to have it out of direct sunlight in room temperature. Now say you find yourself drinking a lot of kombucha and you're making kombucha every day and it suddenly seems very weak and like it's not, it's not doing a very good job at turning into that nice tangy effervescent beverage that you're used to. The reason is you generally want to wait about seven days. So this batch now that we've made and we've taken out the two cups and we have our kombucha sitting in our kombucha hotel, our SCOBY hotel, in that tea, you want to wait two, or you want to wait, two, I was going to say two weeks, you want to wait one week, seven days um, for this particular next batch of the kombucha starter tea, the, these two cups, to develop some strength before you use that as the starter to make your next batch. So always try to wait about seven days between making each batch of kombucha. So after seven days, you start with a clean jar, you brew your tea, you add your sugar, and then you add your new SCOBY, your baby SCOBY that you grew, and that's your fresh SCOBY. You put that in your jar, you add your two cups of your starter tea that's now a mature starter tea because it's been sitting in here for seven days, and you put that in, and then you start the whole process all over again. And that should make a nice batch of kombucha. Now, a few other things I had discussed throughout the process of, of making this batch of kombucha in this video, but I just want to review again. Uh, remember, don't overbrew the tea and don't squeeze the tea bags because the tannins will give an off flavor to your final product. And something that I want to stress is that if you want to flavor kombucha, as we did here, that's a two-step process. You have your first fermentation and your second fermentation. Do not add flavorings to in the initial uh, first ferment when you have your SCOBY in this jar and you're fermenting the tea. You want to do that in two steps. If you add the flavorings to your initial batch, you can create problems. What can go wrong is that the different flavorings that you may add, whether it's fruit, ginger, lemon, lemon, other fruits, other herbs and spices, it can actually inhibit the growth of your SCOBY. So that's why we do two ferments. The SCOBY just wants to be in black tea, sweetened with sugar. And another problem I mentioned previously, and I just want to stress again, is before you start the second ferment, be sure to give your SCOBY a good stir. Give it a good stir the first time when you take out your two cups of starter tea to reserve uh, with your SCOBY for preparing to make another batch in the future, and then give it another good stir before you pour it into the jar or into the bottle where you're doing your second ferment. That's very important because you really want to distribute that good bacteria. And the next tip I want to share with you that will help prevent a lot of problems, and I get a lot of questions about this, can I use a non-caloric, <laughs> I can say that word, non-caloric sweetener? No, it doesn't work well. What happens is the SCOBY needs the sugar the, to eat. The yeast and the bacteria that have this symbiotic relationship in the SCOBY need that sugar to eat. And so you really don't want to use a non-caloric sweetener. It's not going to work well. You need to give the SCOBY food, and that food is the sweetener. So as I said earlier, if you want to avoid sugar, then best to use fermented vegetables for your probiotic source as opposed to these uh, fermented beverages. 
So I hope you'll give making homemade kombucha a try. It's a lot of fun. And, and if you'd like to learn more about traditional nutrient-dense cooking, be sure to subscribe to my channel and then click on this video over here where I have a short playlist for making other fermented drinks like a ginger bug for homemade ginger ale and water kefir. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.